thanks uh, to you all for coming out on a cold night. Thanks again to the walker. I was thinking earlier, I did my math, checked it twice. Uh, this uh, year-end for us occasion uh, uh, marks 15 years of collaborations between Rain Taxi and the Walker. And th thank you. <laughs> um, and, it, and it has been a joyous journey. Um, uh, and as Ashley said, please uh, join us out in the lobby afterwards and, and let's celebrate that as well as everything else that's, that's happening. Uh, tonight, to end our year, we've created um, a special double bill. And uh, it's a double bill that contains doubles within doubles. Uh, so look for them all. Uh, uh, tell us about them afterwards, a prize if you name them all. Um, but uh, this is, uh, like all our events, we hope this will be a layered experience for you uh, and really invite you to sit back and, uh, and enjoy it. Uh, our two poets tonight, Gillian Connolly and Brian Laidlaw, um, I, but I'm very fond of both of them. Uh, for people in the poetry community, uh, Gillian Connolly has become an indispensable voice, uh, and each new book is greeted, greeted uh, as an occasion for um, serious contemplation. Uh, uh, this year, uh, she has not one new book, but two new books, um, both of which are receiving already wide acclaim. Uh, her own newest poetry collection is called Simply Peace, uh, and I think the title... Um, uh, itself is kind of a bold statement uh, about what is so sorely needed in our world. Uh, her other newest title is uh, a book of translations of the writer and artist, French surrealist Henri Michaud, uh, called Thousand Times Broken. And these are texts that have never previously been translated before. And, um, and when you read them, you, you will appreciate that they are now available in our language. Um, Brian Laidlaw, of course, very familiar to local audiences as the band leader of Brian Laidlaw and the Family Trade, uh, an uh, excellent lyricist and a very fine uh, poet for the page as well. And tonight we celebrate the release of his gorgeous new hybrid poetry chapbook and vinyl LP, uh, amazingly produced by paper darts, like everything they produce, it's gorgeous, called A Moratorium. Uh, this is so hot off the press that you might have seen us stuffing the vinyl into the chapbook and into its plastic sleeve as you came up tonight. Uh, but they are there. They are they are um, ready for you uh, to enjoy. So uh, really, you can read more about both of these writers in your program. There, there are deeper bios. I don't want to rehash that. I do want to send you to the Walker Art Center's uh, blog in which um, Brian and Gillian uh, conducted a, 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 a very fun conversation about poetics and what they're both up to. Uh, a little bit of that is in your program, but please go check out the whole thing if you haven't already. Uh, so I hope you're, you'll welcome both of these writers and, uh, and, their, and their kindred spirits. Uh, and to start us off tonight, Gillian Connolly. Thanks so much, Eric. It's good to be here. I have two pair of glasses. In case I lose one, one falls. These things happen to me. Um, I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'll, I'll read from both books, but I'm going to read from Peace first. And the, um, the genesis of this book came from um, the, the work I do. I, I work with people that are generally somewhere between 20 and 30 years old, and it occurred to me that I had been staring into faces of people that had not experienced anything but nonstop war for that length of time. And then I thought that uh, it was probably an illusion that I thought that I had uh, experienced something different. So the whole question of, of what is peace um, informs the work. So I'm going to switch back and forth between both books, between uh, my work and the Michaud translation. And the first poem I'll read is um, 
the first poem in the book that is called, it, the title of it is An O, A Sky, A Fabric, An Undertow. And it's, um, the, the title and the first line are the same, so I won't say them twice. Unless I forget. Okay. An O, a sky, a fabric, an undertow, a blanket laid upon the grass. All the mixed faces looking out or looking in, the great paintings in yard sales and museums, abstract to representational oils, acrylics, ink. In the poem, the evening is spread out like a media to let the windbag out of, to neutralize our eternal footman who is presidentially nimble and wears a big gold middle ring to wrap us on the head with. When the sky is a slow-moving sea life, a poker tell, the solitary night finches nested deep, dead asleep, in urban bamboos, tall corridors, no longer a president. Only an invisible, indivisible male muse, all oscuro, dark substance, molecularly swarming in fields, in cities, like a cloud rising from sidewalks to make individual appearances, so shaded, so shrouded in oil, Whistler could have done him. Sometimes appearing in well-cut overcoat, or next to a tall case clock to say, look, this was the deal made a long time ago. Can you give me a ride to the vacated cities with most hospitable ports? A couple of lonely men had plans that got shoved this way for a building we could aspire to enter. I donated, then got distracted for a building we could enter. Perhaps we shouldn't aspire, I mean, but it is good to build it now as then. I am entering the poem now, not just to notice the pronoun I, but how casually the no longer a president has used it. The sky is a sea we all committed before sinking into the most hospitable port where dust plays dark before flying invisibly into undeadly messengers done up as citizens. So it's all substance to make our children's lives better than now. A situation I would take as conduit, as altar, our groceries. There is a lot of room for metaphysics in this country. I call waiting the GPS navigational finding device, enhanced search the overly Google mapped, severe lack of frontier in the world. So lots of people have begun exploring the sewers, recording sounds of manhole covers as cars roll over them. Only 12 feet down, it feels like 100, and there are rubber boots called waders, but they fill up quickly and are discarded. The idea is to tramp what all gets transformed back into Earth's core. I would like to take some of the infant stardust that has fallen on your head. Why can't I be shrouded in it, if only under current? I used to say my sister sold time on the radio because that's what she did. But then television leveled soundscape, the pleas of the palm tree rustle in the gelatin print, internet cresting event, manual or mental, a loose sally of the mind, all of it suggesting streams of attenuated speeches by absent friends who said, time, we're no more living in a landscape beyond end of the river valley of that particular program. Now, time says, it will save a working copy of the image with a slightly different name. My sister and I continue to run up and down the stairs. Now I will give her a feminine ending or an infant star fabric to unfurl. The lonely men were right to want to fold their flags back into a triangle when someone died. 
we could unfold and try once more to open a language in which we do not do most of the killing. A drop-in date for the ungrievable. Some will always refuse this country to come forward. We could all take off our skulls and stare into them, ecstatic in the contours, rank waterfalls, gray-green opal stones, the alert pianist, key phrases of the Arcadians, Indo-European root rot, dew wop, the dead recircling rocky crags where recline the born or birthing wet with their last or first words, we could take our fallen off temperate fur and begin to recite a Greek story, a groan. Now, see how fast now can go. To what does it matter? World to come, word to hold in the mouth and swallow. Untapped, what does it mean if there is no way to say it, if you haven't heard it before? So we are all writing, 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 and people say there are too many books, though it seems to be reading that refuses to die. This is the good part, the part looking at the part. Can you tell if this is the good part? You can tell if this is the good part, if it is the part looking back at you, not wanting to see someone else airbrushed all over you. It is the feeling of being embodied by the person you love or are sweet on, enchanted by. Not that they fill you, but that you are them. They've come to live inside you. You look like them. You are so them, you see through them and imagine they are looking at you, being them. So, where are you? I am still beautiful. Okay, so now we're going to, I'm going to switch tracks to um, a translation that just came out with City Lights about, in September, of three books by Henri Michaud. Um, these three books were all written between 1956 and 1959 during an 11-year period. Uh, in which Michaud experienced, uh, experimented with mescaline. Uh, Henri Michaud was born in 1899 and died in 1985 at the age of 84. Some of you are probably really familiar with him, with him and his work, and some of you might not be. He was a double artist in that he was both a writer and a visual artist. His life is a... Visual artist almost eclipses his um, recognition as a writer. Uh, his visual art was shown in the Guggenheim, in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. It's collected all over the world. Um, he wrote over 30 books of poetry, prose, travelogues. He had 60 years of a creative life. Um, considered one of the most influential French writers of the 20th century, although he was not French, he was from Belgium, and he moved to France when he was 24 years old. Um, there, He had two obsessions, two concerns in his writing. One was to delve into the uh, unconscious mind and to report back what he saw which is why mescaline was, in, was an intriguing substance for him. He was, it should be made clear that he was not a drug addict in any way. He was a teetotaler, in fact. And a neurologist friend of his who knew his work and knew what he was trying to do suggested that he try the drug because apparently one of the uh, properties of mescaline is that a, uh, a part of the brain remains extremely lucid and there while one is experiencing hallucination, hallucinations and visions. Um, so let's see, what else can I tell you? The other, the other concern and obsession of his is that he wanted to create a universal language that was somewhere between writing and drawing. Um, 
And while he never is successful in doing this feat, he does manage to place us in a position where we can't tell whether or not he's writing or drawing or we are seeing or reading. And I've got some slides to show you to do that. And so if the magical people, there they are. Okay. <laughs> All right, and I have a little clicker thing. This is Michaud uh, when he arrives in Paris in 1924. This is the same year that André Breton publishes the first Surrealist Manifesto. And the Surrealists really wanted Michaud to join their group, but he refused. Um, he had two problems with automatic writing. One was that he didn't think it was possible for the human hand to write as fast as the human brain could think. And he also didn't think that language as a construct could um, capture the unconscious as quickly as, as that was needed. So he told the surrealist to go away. <laughs> OK. I'm trying to get this to, where do I point it? Up there? Hello. It's like a remote. Oh, 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 sorry, okay. Wait. Yeah, point it up this way, huh? There we go. Okay. This is the very first visual piece that he ever did, uh, which blows me. It's a simic writing. You know, you know, it's like a Western writing system. It goes left to right. Um, you can see that they are marks, but you know, you can't tell that it's an alphabetic mark. There's even gaps as though it were a paragraph. And at the very, very, very bottom, you can see what looks like the beginnings of the human face. So the he had a disappointment with with his tools, with both language and with, with the tools of, draw, of drawing and of painting. And it's intriguing to me that he starts here, you know, rather than coming to that conclusion after working for so long with, with those mediums. Oh, back to there. Here we go. I'm going to skip that. This is an early gouache. Um, you can see the human face at the top there, and then the one next. And the whole corpus of the body are also human faces. He had, as you'll see in the other slides that I'm going to show you, he had a, um, he does a lot of portraits of the human face, though he has a lot of trouble with it, that he, he wants to get rid of it, and because it's a sort of barrier to the unconscious that the face is something that is not indicative, it, we need to remove it to go deeper than that to get to the unconscious mind. Frottage was one of his favorite ways of working. This is a mixture of cray uh, crayon and frottage. This is one of my favorite pieces of his. I think it's obviously done in charcoal. And this is also crayon and um, frottage. And there's another watercolor in ink. This is a color. You can see that it's a face as well as a sort of larval. Um, he, Peter Shedal re referred to him as a master of equivocation, that he wasn't quite alive or dead, but somewhere in between those two worlds. And this is where he, he returns to this sort of alphabetic writing with figures and facing the locks. And there you go again, see where you see the left to the right. This one's in the 60s and it looks a little bit more primitive, but again, it's like a system of writing. And then this one is similar to that. And here I think you can see the influence of action painting, somebody like Pollock. And this is a very light painting 81, Michaud dies in 80, uh, 89, so at, the, at the age of 84. So he's, this is a, a really light piece. And then, come on, little friend. Dee, dee, dee. Blank page. 
this is the uh, original book cover of one of the books I translated, Amen. <coughs> Katsen Doming Kwa, 400 Men on the Cross. And there's the frontispiece of it. Michaud very much wanted to become a priest um, as an adolescent, and his father dissuaded him uh, and made him go to medical school for a year, and he dropped out and joined the Merchant Marines. But this book is about his lost faith. And it's the only book in which we see Michaud shaping poems into visual um, shapes. And I'll show you what that looks like. There's, there's the one, this is in the original French. And there are three uh, pen and ink drawings of, the, of Christ on the crucifixion. And these are the shapes. And there it is in English, where you get these kind of partial crosses. Another crucifixion. This, uh, one of the other books that's in this book that I translated is uh, Vigie sur, sur Cible, which is Watchtowers on Targets. It's a collaboration he did with the Chilling and Abstract Expressionist uh, Roberto Mata. And this is a Mata drawing. And the, these are epistolary postcards that Michaud wrote in response to Mata's drawings. It was the only epistolary writing he did. And this is the original book cover from what I'm going to read to you, Peace in the Breaking. Um, Michaud wanted this book to be a scroll, like an, an ending sort of scroll. And since he couldn't get that, the closest he could get was something like a uh, if you could imagine a legal pad in which the, the top of it is drawn back. And let me show you the The book starts with, no, 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 no. There you go. The book starts with, uh, there are 14 drawings like this. I can show you here as well. Um that are these spinal seismographic drawings that they increase in size and then by the end of the of the 14 of them they dissolve into um, just birds with uh, the wing the beats of wings without the rest of the bird's body and so I'm gonna now read to you from that book so if we could go to the next uh, PowerPoint situation, which likely I don't have to click on. Is it coming? One thing I should tell you is that the poem, Peace in the Breaking, is also written in the shape of these kind of uh, seismographic spinal, uh, the same sort of form. And this is probably the most mescaline of the mescaline texts. And if you know, if you know Miserable Miracle, this poem is sort of a, very much a companion to that. Okay. Peace in the Breaking. And I'm going to read this poem loud and fast because I think that's how it wants to be read. Space coughed up on me, and then I no longer exist. The skies roll their eyes, the eyes that say nothing and don't know much. From a thousand crushings crushed, extended to infinity, witness of infinity, infinite all the same, set to infinity, native land that offers, that doesn't use my two hands, that but, but that grinds up a thousand hands, I recognize yet do not know, that embraces me and through mixing subtracts me from myself, opens me up, and assimilates me. To the swarm I return, thousands of swallows' wings tremble across my life, 
furrow, the split form of an immense being accompanies me and is my sister. I listen to the thousands of leaves, open petals, petals without an end, perfumed with the perfume of the unsayable, flower of the perpetual, shot in the head, silent fire of photons, white lightning, prolonged lightning, endless lightning, chills, immense environs, gusts, violet gusts, gusts against the bird, and a high space under my open forehead, suddenly I see the line that perverts, that drags you along in the Baroque. I know, however the space and my space that itches, let's continuously move and bubble. White vermin with overly fine embroidery that runs everywhere and gets nowhere, too fine, too fine, and that stretches me, undermines me, and frays me, space that madly horripilates me in lace and plucks out my mind, crowd, crazed, crook back crowd, chills translated into chiseled palaces with columns that are too slender, too slender, brilliance through failure, ornaments through tickling, stalactites through sliding. In fact, because of the powder I have eaten, all those creases have come out, those creases and all that gleams and all that contradicts itself and contradicts me and contradicts what I say when I say that I, crumbs of I, crumbs far away from I, big oblique S's form it, force me to serpent curved difficulties. The multiple cuts me up, manhandled, down, poof, poof, poof. Thought stoppers incessantly, suddenly whisk me away, keeping my head under expansion. In Tala Bell, in Tala Bell, in Tala Bell, I fight, atrocious, atrocious, the torrent. Hell becomes wool, transport. An immense soul wants to enter my soul. Islands incessantly capsize in my ocean. Totally low chewed. I'm lapped up. I lie dying. I love. I marry my death. Depth, depth, depth. I flow. I'm allowed to die again, again. A great sequence of flights, of empty flights, abstract flights. A force, a force of joyful growth, staggering extension, a force going to the end of the world. How to calm the countless wings of the force that lifts me and lifts me more and more. Peace, peace through crushed seeds. I make peace with the softness of silk raising me up without privileges. All the foliage of the forests of the earth has the shuddering in whose unison I shudder. A strange lengthening, a strange prolongation, a superabundant destitution, a con continuous levitation. Will I ever be able to descend again? Except I have broken my shell. Simple, I leave the prison of my body. The air, the beyond of the air is my protector. The flood has lifted my burdens. The abandonment of the empire of myself has extended me infinitely. No need now of my corpse. The only life I lead is the life of the temple. In the region of the primordial, the narrator shuts up. The one who is here is no longer covered. Outside his body, the desert provides for him. Purity gives birth to me. I have gone through the door. I go through a new door. Without moving, I go through new doors. I leave behind the fool, the certain, the competitor. Because of my extreme thinness, I pass through. Because of a thinness that has no equal in nature, the light omnipotent current has stripped me. My waist no longer sticks to me. I have no more waist. 
purified of masses, purified of densities, all connections purified in the mirrors of mirrors, illuminated by what extinguishes me, carried by what drowns me. I am a river in the passing river. May temptation come no more to stop me, to fixate me, to situate me. May temptation come no more to interfere. Blessed be the waves of equalization that from a solemn arch overcome each instant waves that bring diadem and wound. An almost exquisite suffering goes through my heart and my chest. Meanwhile, an extreme cold seizes the members of my deserted body. My soul, unburdened of the burden of myself, follows in an infinity that animates it and does not take shape. The upward slope, upward, always farther upward, the slope. How had I not encountered it before? The slope that aspires, the marvelously simple, unstoppable ascent. Okay. <laughs> That's the end of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Henri Michel. Um. Wow. <laughs> in, in putting together this um, program, Brian... Laidlaw and I got to talk a lot to one another about poetry, and um, Michaud has a very beautiful statement about the poem that's just really short that I thought I would read to segue back into, um, I'm going to read more from my own book, From Peace, and he's talking, he, he's defining the poem here, um, and some of the stuff Brian and I talked about were the differences between poetry and lyric and poetry and music and poetry and painting and all of that. So Michaud says, the poem, a thousand times broken, presses and pushes to construct itself, to reconstruct for one immense, unforgettable day in order to, through everything, reconstruct us. There's so much going on up here. All right. So now we go back. You can just pretend a giant car wash washed over you. <laughs> this poem is called... Um, there's, there, there's kind of a, there are two that go together, tenderness of the dove and toughness of the serpent, which are, you know, biblical. I think it's from the Old Testament. And this is tenderness of the dove. And the first two, there's tender, as in, you know, touch, heart, tender, and then tinter, as in smoke and fire. Tender or tender, put me in one, a box, with velvet lining, stay the glove to warm the hand. Quivering masterfully, the fishes etched in lime. Down river, thick with stream, it was too quiet to hear the ringing, and yet we wed a changeling to a trifling. A red sweater was my love, a color rinsed my hair, a guitar we all gave out playing. And this is toughness of the serpent. Um, and Martin Luther King is in it. I refer to him as MLK. And it's set during the, uh, the bus boycott in Alabama. Toughness of the serpent. I think maybe we should take out 10 or 12 of them just to show that we are serious, says E.D. Nixon to MLK. Montgomery's steam fallen into leafiness, warm midnight temper of faucet water, transfigurative green Cadillac of one Mrs. A.W. West catching the dew in her carport. Dreaming and waking blood brotherhood of those tried to live paradise, buses empty in the recessive spaces. 
MLK really tired at this point. Wonder what he's got on his mental sky. Moon yellow scorch of the morning iron. Serene, serene. And the next poem is called Occupied. Uh, the Occupied movement in Oakland and New York, and I'm sure here as well. Maybe I should tell you about this photograph. There was a photograph that was circulated wildly, wi wildly, widely, on the internet of a, a policeman um, groping a woman who was protesting. His hand, literally, it's very hard to get a hand into a sports bra, and yet there it was, and uh, it was circulated through the internet and um, it makes it its way into the poem. Occupied. Remaster, I got big sign, I amble off, face lit as skin of someone bathing. Young frayed hoods smell saltier. Police refuse the stairs. One gropes a breast under a sports bra, historical pick. Crowd shoots all, then closes behind. Laptop, you sexy thing. Anti-crow, anti-crow, anti-crows and swoops the street, imperfectible. Police seem to have insatiable sexual appetites. Skyscraper bends over itself as if to bow or readjust. Then lighthouses, a tangerine falling out of a tent is a real tangerine. And people are intemperate, out of air current, hot breath, and other waves of being, wherein each calls for the other, gives a sign. How to lift the limit between the body and the world. Birds cry. Lovers die. Hermit can't eat the plastic. The sports bra snaps back of great design. Vet of bones, all his brothers dead inside him, stops to pose with the lean of a milkman, smiles his truths of 1945. The policeman's hand is gone, imaginal, archetypal. The best messages are mutual and free from all ambition, like a wishbone. Hermit licks the wrapper. Steve Jobs, we're sorry you died. Images feel good taken into the human palm. How to back into our new instruments. How light November rain. Okay, and there's a couple of poems that are titled piece, and they're really short. They're about eight lines a piece. Um, and I don't know what this term is called in music, but in poetry it's parataxis, where there are lines that are sort of oppositional to one another. In the Greek it literally means placing opposites next to each other. So I'll read a couple of those. And they're kind of sprinkled throughout the whole book. And they're all, all titled piece, but I'm not going to say that over and over because it gets a little weird. Half tone of a couple in a four poster who left their breath together or took too much. White clabbered, distant city. Her vagina, his cock, slack in the cosmological moisture. Christ gets so misquoted once they put the Latin in him, looking out of the picture, wanting nothing. Here's another one. Smells of sweat deep in sportful fields, eyes opened and were thrilled or soothed and sustained. We had won. Cars passed along streets in bright difference or decay. In argument, context shivers the trigger words. Before munitions, oil extracted from the cotton makes the town smell sweet. No corpus, only bodies eidolon. Marijuana-scented hush of the glove compartment. In your device, a person spies the bridge in flames, then flees. So old school, the photo in its bath. 
Contrary to history, to war's punctuations, the almost dripping popsicle held from the body on the heat-buckled sidewalk, earth's involuntary memory to descend and ascend, the round, the blow, to begin all over again. And I'll read you a longer poem. This, um, I wanted to write a poem about Gandhi. And so I did a lot of research and um, decided that I, I couldn't do it. And then I found a lot of un-Gandhi-like things ab out about Gandhi and ended up writing a poem called Trying to Write a Poem About Gandhi. And it's in three parts. One. The future leaves roses on the bed for the long stretch of the waker at the window left to pull the day around. History props up and swarms a lot of time. Wonder will he walk back? Should we still run to keep up with him? Fingers quick to thread the spinning wheel. A dizziness in the face of a social machine. Silver infinitesimal moats shine, lift, and hover cloud. I shake out the dryer's lint drawer into garage air. Satyagraha. No power over the soul. The body suffers. Two. A silver pocket watch pinned to a loincloth. Better to hand wash in past and in future Postmodernism's gone all artisan. Moat swirling up into stale garage air. Open door to let it drift out, spread into wisteria's tresses. Ahimsa, a matter not of the intellect, but of the heart. Three, beloved figures die, then stop and loop to pixelate. A history sweeps and fells the picture field. In uppermost loamy branches of the giant oak sit Thoreau, Tolstoy, Ruskin, Emerson, and Carlyle, shining down their texts. Unorthodox social moralists of the 19th century still trying to freeze hell. Many leafy wandering past participles in my neighborhood alone. Also, one assault rifle, a shotgun, two Glock pistols, one tactical armored vest, how do I know this, several gas masks, one child's ballistic leggings, ballistic helmet, one known pedophile, best to try not to wish anyone dead, think John Berriman, I woke up and I had not murdered anyone before I turned back to the dryer, thinking why think, or try to be like Marx, who said at the end of his life, I am not a Marxist. That's my girl's lost blue sweater hung on the fence post. Best to think of even nuisances in your inbox as pilgrims on earth, immortal spirits on probation. Four, how to make of one's garden a Tolstoy farm and be chief magistrate, prime minister, main teacher, chief baker, chief sanitary inspector of a modest magnetic field produced by electric currents in Earth's outer core, on Earth's crust primarily quartz, silicon dioxide, and other silicates like feldspar. One, two, bright day. Here comes Manu and Abha. Manu Grand niece and Abha, wife of grand nephew, Gandhi's girls and walking sticks, his hands on their shoulders as he walked everywhere with them toward the end. Poverty easy, but chastity eludes and means funny sleeping arrangements. Younger and younger naked girls to sleep beside to maintain chastity, brahmacharya, Elimination of all desire in the face of temptation. Accept the body, you pussy. 
picture field says dropping down. Great thinkers are scheming demotic despots. It's a thin line to undo and silly to be an apologist for a pacifist. Dale Carnegie, friend. Madame Blavatsky, friend. Why think God doesn't like pussies, cocks, girls, Gandhis all together? Well, you'd have to ask the girls. And later, it's a sub rosa geological planet with shifting hot mantles of tectonics. Someone should tell Einstein, even though it's too late, who said, future generations will hardly grasp that such a man as this walked upon the earth. Palm fronds for shade. Basil, peppers, early tomatoes here. Strawberries under chicken wire to frustrate deer. In the garden, moats and mites, all waxes and wanes in shadows leafy deep sea ocularity. The future drags and drifts and lifts traces of argon, carbon dioxide and water, sun's majestic past and impending life. You cannot hope to wake anyone who isn't fully asleep, he said. You cannot wake those who are pretending sleep. Okay. And now it is my great pleasure to ask Brian Laidlaw and Bex and Danny to come up and join me so I'm not standing up here all alone and lonely. To, uh, we did a collaboration of a poem of mine called The Long Marriage. Don't let the title freak you out. It's not a sad poem. It's a little sad, but not too bad. <laughs> if it is true that I you don't exist, but we are in it for the eternity. For the once in the pink, orange, blazing dawn, I put on your black underwear. Doing there, in my drawer, stunned, pleased at the hip fit, years to a bus you jumped out of in your duct-taped boots, there was snow. You were so happy to be coming to see me I saw you from the window's vectored frost, a brown feathery hen here to roost, though you were the male. Now the white birch drifts a thousand moats back into the house to eat off our dust and fly. We sire and wench, harmony and ash until conversation Consumption, interrogation, and the small back of the sweet talk become so paradisical, primitive, warped, I fall into the lace of your gutter. Pretty nice there. And we have to wire prose into the talk to get the poem, to get the rope that l runs long and free out the cave. Mastodon-like to crawl on all fours to birth some intelligibles. Got a grease fire in the kitchen for a long time coming. Couples forming a rustling seriality up city halls, granite steps, night-long cormorant moon. 20 pairs of black underwear in a super bag be lit with break of dawn's exalt as when media hyperglosses our lives but not as bad as your mom and dad. And we think of our dreams with their heterodoxy. And did I tell you mine or dream it? The lava-like tar congealing into blue-black bubbles and asphalt we could pop with each step. Sissy Spacek and Martin Sheen in the movie of our first date 
both so young, all they could do was kick thoughtlessly at the dirt and kill everyone in their wake but us. SpaceX short shorts, her childlike, almost womanlike legs. Sheen's cigarette pack folded back into the sleeve of his T-shirt. We rose, stumbled, found each other's hands up the aisle pitch dark and stood before the turn lights turning jade green water. If anoint is a drop of oil on our foreheads, if one by one alteration finds, we toss our hair down a tower for longer arousal. We want to be seen in the eyes of the government. If marriage is empire's locket, we get in bed like students to its sheets, though we hate the acquisition and the light moves. How many instances of unity feel more like bicycles attached to cars? But that was your dream. I get on the bus going nowhere in particular, sit in sun for the warm. The bus heaves sideways before lurching down our street, crowded, it is Wednesday, with the Episcopalians' AA meetings' cars, each shining, obediently parked. Luck, its inexact clarity. Soft as tracing paper, the house lay loose linoleum, carpet, tile, and oak for surfaces to pace, parse, backtrack. If this is the hallway, where a savage tiger with stitches mends itself and runs. We cannot occupy it absolutely. Ion, eon. If this is the vertigo of another, one song alone, one spinet, many breezes, firmament, and water. The psalm and plasm in the particulars of the jungle where we walk to see it snow. If we are so angry, if we are so happy, if no eye contact, the wind tears hard at it. could probably make a killing with a movie about you and me the first person is the villain and the second is a killing spree but every writer is a demon so don't believe a word he sings he'll steal your dreams while you are dreaming about clipping an angel's wings he'll steal your dreams while you are dreaming about clipping an angel's wing. Awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Let's have one more round of applause for Gillian Connolly. She's the greatest. Um, such a, such an honor to get to be a part of this program with her. She is my favorite living poet, and it is truly a dream to get to be here doing this. Um, and uh, that the sort of point of intersection between um, that poem, uh, The Long Marriage, and the song that I wrote that I sang just a short excerpt of, because I can't write a song with fewer than eight verses in it. Um, 
was uh, the Terrence Malick movie Badlands, which is um, the uh, Sissy Spacek um, movie that gets a shout out in that uh, in that poem, and it also happens to be the, um, it's a movie that is about the, a different um, young romantic uh, couple of murderers uh, active in the Midwest, um, the uh, Starkweather, and he was the, also the inspiration for Springsteen's album, Nebraska, which is my favorite Springsteen album, one of my favorite uh, records of all time. Um, at any rate, uh, the project some stuff from is about um, is about Bonnie and Clyde, and I wanted to set it up. Woo! Yeah, wow. Yeah. I know, I feel the same way. You're in the right place. Um, so uh, this is just a quote. This is the sort of serves as the inscription, and this will sort of set, set things up, you know. Um, and uh, this is an inscription from the screenwriter who wrote the Bonnie and Clyde movie, and he says, I'd grown up hearing all the stories about Bonnie and Clyde, Everyone knew someone who'd been robbed or kidnapped by them. Any farmer that had an old car that didn't work, they'd take it out, shoot it full of holes, pour some animal blood on it, and show it off as the car Bonnie and Clyde were killed in. Um, and that to me really, that gets, Eric was asking about doubling. He was asking you to pay attention for, for doubling, and this is like a little hint, that's some doubling. The, the doubling between real Bonnie and Clyde and um, fictional Bonnie and Clyde on screen. Um, <clears throat> So thinking about that, um, I, I, my, one of my sort of starting points for this project was like imagining Bonnie and Clyde before they were famous or infamous or anything, and when they were just two young people, and like at some point, Clyde had to pick up Bonnie. He had to go. He had probably had to go hit on her, <laughs> and that's and that's like that common thing, is so humanizing before um, before everything goes so haywire. So that's gonna be the starting point for this tune. Um, mm. Imagining Clyde picking up Bonnie. And enjoy it. This is a happy tune, and it's the last happy tune. Sorry. <laughs> you guys ready? One, two, three. Did it hurt? Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? Those matches in your eyes and your lips of paraffin Were you flaking like a painting when you fell from heaven And you landed in a fresco for the sticky seraphim Baby, I will pick you up and put you on my arm Pick you up and put you on my arm like a charm Pick you up and put you on my arm I'll pick you up and put you on my arm Was it hard, was it hard when you fell from heaven and you landed in a bar for the billiards and tattoos? Was it hard in the yard with the cigarettes unleavened and the congregation swaying to the continental blues? Maybe I would pick you up and put you on my hip, pick you up and put you on my hip when you slip, pick you up and put you on my hip, or pick you up and put you on my hip. Strange when you fell from grace. Could you read my mind the same way you'd read a cocktail menu? Did you look in a mirror and expect to see your face, but instead see a map to the after party venue? Baby, I will pick you up and put you on my sleeve. Pick you up and put you on my sleeve. Don't you leave. Pick you up and put you on my sleeve. I'll pick you up and put you on my sleeve. I'll pick you up and put you on my sleeve. Pick you up and put you on my sleeve. And 
did it hurt, did it hurt When they nailed you to a windmill And then left you on a hillside Where the west wind played roulette Were you dizzy, were you dizzy Did it keep you busy Until all the guilty parties died And the innocents forget Baby, I will pick you up And put you on my neck Pick you up And put you on my neck Keep you in check Pick you up And put you on my neck I'll pick you up And put you on my neck I'll pick you up And put you on my neck Pick you up And put you on my neck Serve and protect Pick you up And put you on my neck I'll pick you up And put you on my neck I followed a blackbird when I was lost in the wood. Said, let's make a memory. It'd do you some good. But she was an actress with decades of practice. Her shadow theatrics don't fool me no more. When I needed a smidgen of old time religion I came to her kitchen and we fell to the floor And I still believe we did it out of love And I know my right Coming from above Well it made me a black sheep From the first time I came The willows and whippoorwills Have forgotten my name And her nest was a shambles of shadows and brambles Where everyone gambles on love at first sight And our engines were revving like angels in heaven Was it snake eyes or sevens we rolled that first night Well, I still believe I hear those hound dogs bark I know my rider When I feel her in the dark Now be the setting sun Be a holy roller Wake me when they come, or wake me when it's over. Now I can't find my blackbird. She vanished in the dark. And we didn't make history, but history made us. And the horsemen are coming, I know that they're cunning they hit the ground running and never look back But if you think my mistress will beg for forgiveness Then black sheep ain't misfits and blackbirds ain't black And I still believe we did it out of love And I know my rider Coming from above Yeah, I still 
a poem called Aspect Ratio slash Pre-Contact. You and I championed chambers, be they of the gun, heart, or judiciary, echoing hellos to one each other like dead daisies tied up in a chain link. We hang in a hammock and query our seeming seamlessness, our apparent parentheticals. You is the target at the center, a kernel of pollen, bright dimpled. A feature called a firing pin embosses on the saucer part of bullets. You is the gavel on the sidewalk. The goal is to snatch you up like a mimeo redoubling the you-ness in my coin purse or the meanness in my billfold or the seemliness of blanks sliding in for impressment. In the marketplace of ventricles, you are a love florist or an alveoli forest. You get away with me, get away with highway robbery. One time we were a oneness, untroubled by otherness, making peaceful factions. You could have spat all day killing swallows and put it, putting the wadded dough of their breasts into satchels. I is a romantic naturalist. I is the first person who could make, buy, or steal you something, while meanwhile you is, is the second person, in context, the accomplice. I can watch the far stalks of the corn standing steadfast in the close rows in a swath of gold unfolding as we sped past. Up closer, see the footprints, but can only guess the dangers by the rows for irrigation, the double barreled chambers, and the lines converge where the copper meets the blue, where my lines collide. With you. Now marsh hawks in the heat and their fleets buzz the sunroof, heedless of the traffic, indivisible and gunproof, moving through my sight lines on the tethers of their radiance, darker than light speed, outrunning their own radiance, and the crows dissolve. And like the bodies of the birds, my lines dissolve into yours. And farther south, the crows fly down the barrels of the grapevines. A reminder from the sky there's no distinguishable state lines. Farmers at the edges the crops that they're defending fire at the crows above whose arcs are never ending and the crows dissolve and lie the bodies of the birds my lines dissolve into yours
we camped at a lake like a tarnished symbol and looked at the people we'd slowly become. I'd always dreamt that I'd be your thimble, a bullet of silver protecting your thumb. But babe, don't go back there The black bear is guarding her den And the second she's threatened To tell me what happens then She'll charge down the path With a wrath that will straighten your spine What a marvelous creature That teacher is divine But will our love be as mighty when we're 80 or 90 Will our love, will our love, will our love And will our love be abundant when we're over a hundred Will our love, will our love, will our love but Here on the breeze, a murmur of traffic too faint to tell if it's coming our way The taste on our tongues is hellfire and havoc The thrill of a debt we can never repay Cause the men from the county want bounty They're a ravenous crew And a dollar reward strikes a chord in them too with state-issued pistols and fistfuls of black billy clubs They charge through the bracken, attacking us innocent cubs But will our love be as risky when we're 40 or 50? Will our love, will our love, will our love And will our love be as heavenly when we're 60 or 70 Will our love, will our love, will our love Chest for a pillow I caught myself wishing that you'd never wake Cause the leaves are all blood red In the bloodshed they faltered and froze And the men from your nightmare are right there Arriving in droves The grizzled and their chiseled With their tongues and their teeth Rip through your clothing Exposing the skin underneath At the sight of their shackles My hackles will instantly rise And I charge down the path With the wrath that will widen their eyes I'll fight with such fury They'll surely regret that they came And the reason I love you Is because you would do just the same but will our love be as dirty by the time we turn 30? Will our love, will our love, will our love? And will our love be as risky when we're 40 or 50? Will our love, will our love, will our love? Will our love be as heavenly when we're 60 or 70? Will our love, Will our love, will our love And will our love be as mighty When we're eighty or ninety Will our love, 
Will our love, will our love, will our love be abundant when we're over a hundred? Will our love, will our love, will our love, and will our love have been plenty if we die when we're twenty? Will our love, will our love, will our love? This is a project I've been working on for a really long time, and those of you who have, um, you know, who have known me have known that this has been <clears throat> on the on the back burner or front burner pretty much ever since I moved to Minneapolis. And that last tune, strangely, was the the first song that I started for it, and the last song that I finished. I wrote it the first winter that I was in Minnesota, which was in 2008. I moved out here to do an MFA at the University of Minnesota, and. Uh, <coughs> The first poem and the poem that sort of made everything come together for this project and made me realize that it actually was a project was um, this poem that I'm going to read now called Bonnie and Clyde Look for a Border. And um, they kind of walked into the poem uh, completely unintentionally. I, I did not pick them as a topic and um, we're in a room full of critical thinkers I know so if you're saying that like, um, well this is a, a project that seeks to sort of criticize the way that Bonnie and Clyde were portrayed in the film in the sense that it's like making them less human by turning them into an artwork. Um, and then you're like, but you, you did realize that you also made an artwork based on them? Yes, I did notice that. And um, <laughs> it, you know, when I, I can sort of get away with it, you know, I'm playing at like the 331 Club or whatever, I can probably get away. There's probably no one being in there like, is he aware of the meta <laughs> issues with what he's doing? Um, but anyway, uh, so I didn't, I didn't seek them out. I feel like they kind of sought, sought me out in this weird way. Um, so this is the first poem that they appeared in, and they just kind of walked onto the scene. It's called Bonnie and Clyde Look for a Border. Let's try and triangulate this heathen haven. There's Taylor Creek Falls like a bridal fit veil, sick, kissing spume. There's Divulgence Crag, and we below are in a tub of mud. Tell me, where is the nearest goods, the soonest greats? When's the soonest good due for us like a rain? Here dry Taylor Creek's sick, ain't flush. Well, we shall get sick and supine and retry. There's a chariot shape like a nimbus. There's the hairpin part of the roundabout route. Sick, our babes come unrecognizable back from. I heard of a place without judges, a verse to straighten outright. Bonnie, let's nativize, and they won't never sick their dog on, sick their dog on us again. Um, and uh, I'll just do one more poem here. Um, this project, uh, another sort of weird moment in it. Um, I was maybe you know a couple years into the writing process, and I was on a on a tour coming back from California, and had to pull over to get gas um, just near the uh, the border between California and Nevada. And um, you pull up in the gas station, and um, there's this huge banner uh, between the pumps. Um, and I should actually set the stage a little bit more. It's not just a gas station. It's a gas station, Taco Bell Casino, which they have um, near the, the border between California and Nevada. And um, maybe not my most favorite place I've seen. Um, and uh, in between the pumps, there was a sign that said, see the death car. Um, and so I you know, cruised inside. And um, the, the death car was the actual car that Bonnie and Clyde were shot in. Um, and... They had, they had an exhibit with like Clyde's shirt that had the bullet holes in it and the blood stains on it, and they had a, um, <clears throat> a mirror that he had uh, painted for Bonnie while he was in prison, and um, some of Bonnie's uh, verse, she was a poet, which they described as doggerel verse. Um, and uh, the, it, was, it was so dark to imagine these like, these are, you know, artifacts from like not just a uh, the scene of someone's death, but a really grisly death. And uh, the car, of course, you know, had uh, 237 bullet holes in it or whatever. And um, I don't want to give away the punchline, but it gets worse. Um, so I'll, I'll, read, uh, I'll read this poem about that, that I wrote shortly after that experience. Um, Silt ensues from volcanism around the salon or saloon that everything named Shoshone's got a shed on it is lost on no one. On a horrible road, Clyde's death shirt, baby blue, with suture squares up upon it, like pummeled puka or baby teeth. 
the death car too to witness in the casino shot up, the upshots promoting four ninety nine for all you can drink Bloody Marys. I have sinned badly, as badly in fact as they deed. It's a riddle with bullets, the car and the barroom showroom. I am sorry, everyone is. The lesson's not on sorrow, but on sorriness. The borders illume, the sorrel blood, Bonster's so-called doggerel verse, the adjective knowing a shared root, this time of petite and petition. As easy to prophecy coffee and keep it maintained in the morn, coral or sorrel stains, the petite's pouty faces, a corpse in a cordon of gauze and bond in a corset thereof, I am so, so sorry, I am sorry, she writhes. They caught the baby, blew from him, the death car, the hand mirror, the numerologically relevant figures, the notary rose to notarize this authentic death, the archival bodies we disembodied, I am a so, so sorry nobody, and you are a so, so sorry somebody. It's lawless, okay, around here, we were so close. The rotary ambush rose, the rose bush, the cinnamon rind of the hollow tips, now copper in the penny slots. I confess her, I do the opposite of demonize, maybe reify. Um, and uh, I quickly want to take this opportunity also to thank, um, first, thank Rain Taxi and Eric Lorber for putting this on. I want to thank The Walker um, for their long partnership with this great literary organization and for hosting us this evening, and um, to the sound and light and tech people who are doing such an awesome job. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to Paper Darts, who have been spectacular to collaborate with on this whole project. Let's have a round of applause for them real quick. Um, they, uh, I, I hope you know them. They do such incredible work. Um, and uh, I also want to give a huge thank you. I don't know if there's anyone from the Minnesota State Arts Board or the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council in here, but um, this project was funded in part by those two organizations, and it would have been totally impossible to do without them. So um, I am grateful for them every day, and you guys should be too, because they make a lot of really cool things possible. They make it they make it worth living in a state where on November 20th it might be six degrees outside. <laughs> things like that. We have two Californians on stage tonight too, so it's it's brutal. Um anyways. And a Floridian. Um and a Floridian yeah, right. So. It's not yeah. Um and uh anyways it's it's just a huge honor to get to be here. It's a huge honor to get to share these tunes with you. Um and so let's have a quick round of applause for all of those great people. Um and uh I want to introduce Bex Gaunt on all of the instruments. <laughs> I want to introduce Danny on bass, <laughs> Danny Vitali. Um, and once again, my name is Brian Laidlaw. Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to say was, um, you know, I was thinking about keeping a secret because it's like, I don't want to gush too much up here. But um, really, uh, when we were talking um, many months ago about the possibility of doing some kind of show together with Rain Taxi for um, the release of this thing, uh, Eric asked me, like, who would be your um, sort of dream poet to get to read with, like, anybody, anywhere? And my answer with no hesitation was Gillian Connolly. Um, she's a poet that I admire so greatly, and it's really such a huge honor to get to do this with you. So thank you so much. Let's have another round of applause for Gillian, too. Um, I really, really just can't believe it. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, and this is a, a tune called The Family Trade. Did I mess you up? Oh, yeah. We don't want that we'll sound. Oh, yeah. Huh. There it is. Cool. I have a family. And I know that they know they don't know what I do. Times when they tried to damn me Or change the terrain that my river cut through But they love me without preconditions They send a few coins and provisions They advise me in my bad decisions With the books that they hold to be true They say don't rock the boat Play the hand that you're dealt Have faith in your Lord and in Roosevelt When you're bound by a rope or lashed by a belt They say it's for your own protection And they send it by post and collect a telegram That fame is a hoax 
and pride is a shame, but their letters aren't close to a wide enough dam to cause a distinct redirection. And I don't regret the choices I have made, and I know my blood will not degrade, but I won't take part in that charade of the family trade, the family trade. I have a sibling And I hope that he knows that I know that he's wise When he's drunken and dribbling He'll stare at the air and rhapsodize He says, what is the merit of merit? We'll probably die in a garret Violence is all we inherit That and our pretty boy eyes And he taught me to rob, to brawl and to binge To forego the knob and kick straight for the hinge He keeps his testosterone in a syringe Lest here I should falter and he's the chalk for my blank slate He taught me to talk like a reprobate And when I'm to walk through some narrow strait He is my rock of Gibraltar And I don't regret the choices I have made I know my blood will not degrade But I won't take part in that charade of the family trade, of the family trade. And I hope that she knows that I know I might fail But she helps me recover When the shadows of dogs are too close on my trail Her versions of dreams are benevolent Her morals are rarely self-evident she says, wherever the hell the devil went, he never once landed in jail. And I wasn't cut out for college, all right, but somebody noticed my wattage was bright. You invited me in to your cottage one night and allowed me to stay till the morning. You're the only one I never tried to beguile. You're a claustrophobe and a big File. You said you admired my confident smile And the fear that my smile was adorning And I don't regret the choices I have made And I know my blood will not degrade But I won't take part in that charade of the family Trade, the family trade. Now I have a viewer, and I hope that you know that I know I'm a liar, but I'll help you procure the tailored untruths these dark times require cause my gunplay is screenplay fodder and america loves a marauder my bonnie lies over the water 
by which I mean lies under fire And she and I broke innumerable laws And she and I broke both palates and jaws The audience broke into raucous applause For the prince and the princess of jailbait And there is the upshot of looking genteel An American car with a man at the wheel My dimples and teeth on your magnetic reel Put your head and your heart in a stalemate And I don't regret the choices I have made I know my blood will not degrade But I won't take part in that charade Of the family trade the family trade I have a father And I hope that he knows That I hope that he is proud Fatherhood's like a revolver And children are bullets sprayed into a crowd Their actions aren't meant to be mastered They get wiser, get women, get plastered And I'm not exactly a bastard But I don't speak my surname aloud I'm the son of a lawyer who's the son of a lawyer But I've never had a consistent employer I want to be twain, but I end up like Sawyer So I look for the silver lining And the law too swiftly equates to a noose My heart is the target of my mind's abuse Now my mind and my heart have called for a truce And I hope that you come to the signing and I don't regret the choices I have made And I know my blood will not degrade But I won't take part in that charade Of the family trade Of the family trade Hope that he knows that I know what he's spawned I've been tied to his third of an acre But I've done my worst to unravel that bond Though his image is written in jism Between father and son is a schism We're split like light through a prism the colors the great beyond Now my collar is straight My hair's properly coiffed And I'm stuck in the shallows And the river silt soft God's like a gallows To hold me aloft While the mob at the back door is banging And they're after my tongue For speaking in slang I've been part of the chain Been part of the gang I hope I'm remembered for the hymnals I sang And I hope that you come to the hanging And I don't regret the choices I have made And I know my blood will not degrade But I won't take part in that charade Of the family trade Family trade, the family trade, the family trade. Thank you guys so much.
cool. This one's going to be our last tune. Um, and uh, once again, just thank you guys so much for listening. It's really such a pleasure to get to, to share these tunes in this way. Um, this song sort of catalogs um, some of the, uh, I should clarify, like some of the poems and some of the songs, like the text by and large is totally different, but um, some of them touch on some of the same things. And uh, this is kind of a song equivalent of the, the See the Death Car poem. Um, so it's a, a tune that I wrote about some of the objects that were on display in that little um, casino Taco Bell gas station. We'd only just retired to our hideout on the hill when the morning shots were fired. This is not a drill, and the bullets barrage is not a mirage, though we wish its intrusions were fake. But if the world were on fire, you are what I take. There's the mirror I made in jail from a piece of shattered glass painted with details of daisies and honey grass it holds your reflection and it's also a weapon like any good thing that I make but if the world were on fire There's the comb I whittled there While the inmates sharpened the shifts You run it through your hair as long as you still live Those times kept yourself straight My lover, my cellmate But our walls are no longer opaque If the world were on fire Bible on the dresser, the tears on Mary's cheek, the cross of the confessor to whom I rarely speak, but the rosary's lain like a ball and a chain that I never could manage to shake. If the world were on fire, you are what I take. We've got our guns and knapsacks, our good reserves of rye, a briefcase full of greenbacks to spend before we die, our prayers to the Lord and our keys to the Ford that will guide our miraculous break, but if the world were on fire, you 
So let's assess the damage before we take a, another blast. Will the ink well be your bandage? Will the letter be your cast? Will my decorative touches be a powder cake? Will the letters be crutches to heal? your leg? Will the Bible be fuel and the rosary a fuse? Will it feel like renewal to burn what we choose? As the flames clamor higher, we begin to perspire. Or will it feel like we've made a mistake? We are call the town crier, call me a liar, and call God a fraud and a flake. Will you summon a choir to the widening gyre of the house we're about to forsake? If the world were on fire, you are what I'd take. I'd pick you up and put you on my arm. Pick you up and put you on my arm. Thank you guys so much. Should we, should we, should we have time for one more or we should we cut? I think, we're, I think we are good to go, you guys. Um, we're going to meet you guys out front in the, in the lobby. We hope to um, chat with everybody, answer questions, do a Q&A. And um, once again, thank you so much to Walker, to Rain Taxi, to Gillian. Thank you all.